<laughs> the rapture came early, folks. We are all that remains of the Slice of Sci-Fi News team. And we're coming up next. Covering all the news from every dark corner of the universe. Hello from the children of planet Earth. Hola y saludos a todos. SliceofSciFi.com And welcome everyone to another Slice of Sci-Fi. I'm Michael Armenengay. Yes, folks, the rapture. And guess who's with us? Brian Brown and... I should not be here. <laughs> I'm Megan Zier, and I should be up there. I don't think so. There. I don't think so, Megan. Obviously, you're not because you're here with us. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. We killed her again. <laughs> oh, that sucks. All right. I when we kill people. Hey, but I got some great news you want to stick around for. So. Okay. All, All right. right. I'll struggle my brains back in. And now the news. Well, here's the interesting thing, okay? So uh, I do believe our interview this week is with um, Mr. Jamie Paglia. Yes, it is. Yeah, so uh, while producer Jamie Paglia recently said the fifth season of Eureka will be a love letter to fans, don't expect (laughs) the love letter to be an entirely happy one. Uh, Series star Colin Ferguson says the fifth season of Sci-Fi series will be the, the darkest the series has ever Produced. Really? Yes. Yes. Actually, hmm. it's. Uh, it, it, well, you you watched well, yeah, the first. I did. Yeah, watched so. it. Yeah. But so, I don't know. I think it's gone to some pretty dark places. So. Right. Well, Ferguson says uh, the way in which the last season's cliffhanger is resolved, the greatest plot twist uh, only in this genre can afford. It was a joy to marry that structure change. So Ferguson admits that he's stunned at how the writing staff has worked to reinvent the series in the last couple of years. Adding that the great thing about the writing and producing team is that nothing goes away. Mm-hmm. Oh. Hint, hint. Hmm. Yes, uh, and that the that the residual effects and residual ramifications based on what has happened the first three episodes echoes throughout the fifth season. Mm-hmm. And we've we've only seen the first three, right. which so. means that we have to wait for the rest of the <laughs> like This the is what else he has to say about this. Colin says he says the specifics of what I think would be more spoilery, particularly on how the third episode ended. They continue to resonate through the rest of the series. I am so proud that this is our swan song. If we could do this show, this fin- final season forever, that would be amazing. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, wow! This is always a show we struggled to make. I like that. Colin's a good guy, and he has mm-hmm. some really cool things to say. And Jamie Paglia, we talked to him about this last mm-hmm. season as well because we all got to see it. And well, Jamie's we're gonna have, you got an interview with him coming up yeah, very shortly, so, <laughs> so absolutely That's stick cool. around for that. Uh, <laughs> this is a really bizarre story. Uh, advanced dinosaurs could rule the world. Okay. <laughs> of course. It may Continue. sound like something out of a Roger Corman movie, but there's new evidence that suggests advanced versions of the T-Rex and other dinosaurs have evolved to be the dominant life forms on other worlds. I know. Wait, this what? is so bizarre and so it speculative, so, and it's just so sci-fi laden, and I love everything. Yeah, it is really cool. <laughs> It's a new study in the Journal of American Chemical Society. Scientist Ronald Breslow says that he studied the mystery of why the building blocks of terrestrial amino acids, sugars, and the genetic materials, DNA and RNA, exist mainly in one orientation or shape. There are two possible orientations, left and and right, much like the political parties here in the U.S., yeah, a lot um, like <laughs> which mirrors each other in the same way that hands do, with the exception of the few bacteria and amino acids, all life on Earth have a left-handed left orientation, while most sugars have a right-handed D orientation. Writing in the Journal of American Chemical Society, uh, Breslow suggested unusual amino acids carried to lifeless Earth by meteorites about 4 billion years ago set the pattern for amino acids and sugars on Earth, but says it could have been different on planets in a far-off solar system. This is where the kind of... Okay. The, mm-hmm. <laughs> As implications from this work are, is that elsewhere in the universe, there could be life forms based on D amino acids and L sugars instead. Okay. Such life forms could be well-advanced versions of dinosaurs if mammals did not have the good fortune to have the dinosaurs wiped out in an asteroidal <laughs> collision such as on Earth. Mm-hmm. We, would, we would be far... Uh, be better off not meeting them at all. Yes. 
<clears throat> yeah, I'm like, especially since they have those really big spaceships and everything. Exactly. Maybe we might run into to uh, ETs that are dinosaurs. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think they all look like Dennis Hopper, right? From <laughs> Mario <laughs> Brothers. Oh. <laughs> Boo. Nobody watched that movie. Nobody, Megan. At least wow. one person did. Well, that's true. Um, actress Lauren Col- uh, Cohan has been promoted to a series regular on The Walking Dead. Are you watching The Walking Dead, Megan? That's one. That's another one I have to catch up on. Okay. Well, Cohan, who plays Maggie Green, who's an awesome character, was featured in the most recently com- completed second season of the AMC's hit. Maggie's the daughter of Herschel and the love interest for Glenn in the comics and series. Of course, fans of the, uh, the show that um, know that just because the actor is a regular on the show doesn't mean <laughs> they will not get killed off, folks. That's right. the beautiful thing. This year featured the death of two regular characters in the series. Spoiler alert. Yeah. If you didn't know, if you haven't already finished it. No, I mean, really, it's pretty It's pretty obvious, but they'll right. kill off pretty much anybody, and they kill off one of my favorite characters. That is the sucked. impression I get. Mm-hmm. So, but speaking of Robert Kirkman, uh, with the success of The Walking Dead, AMC has developed, an, is beginning development on another comic book series of his for a show. Okay. The cable network is developing Kirkman's Thief of Thieves. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know that one. Um, it's much like uh, much like The Walking Dead brought horror to television, he says. In a unique and groundbreaking way, I feel Thief of Thieves can do the same for heist stories. Showing the humanity of all the characters, including the criminals. I've not read the series, but now makes me go, dude, I so want <laughs> to. Yes, I know. It, it does sound really, really, really cool. So basically, he said, Thief of Thieves, which was uh, Kirkman based on his experience in the writer's room for The Walking Dead, centers on a master thief, Conrad Paulson, who, while attempting to reconcile with his estranged wife and son, vows to walk the straight and narrow, only to discover he's completely addicted to the thrill of stealing. Aww. Now he must feed his addiction by stealing only what's been stolen as the Thief of Thieves. Wow. He's like a Thief Dexter. Pretty much. Uh, it's kind of cool. Yeah. So it's actually a really, really cool thing. I think that's a, a really well, cool story. And Kirkman's awesome. I yeah, like him a lot. He really is. Uh, All right. Do we have enough time for one more story? No, or? we better jump to, we better jump into uh some multiverse. Some multiverse, okay. Yes. <laughs> Neutron Media presents Lance Neutron's Multiverse News featuring Lance Neutron. Good evening, I'm Lance Neutron and you're lucky. Our top story tonight, for the first time, a human has made the list of the top 10 most influential beings in the galaxy. Yes, talk show host and producer Oprah Winfrey debuted at number 8 after her media empire went interstellar. An angry Galactus, who was bumped down to number 11, threatened to eat Oprah's planet. Oprah has her own planet now? Talk show host and producer, huh? That gives me an idea. Where's Lance? Lance, where are you going? Hey, Bosco, uh... Um, you can't just... Have, have Blackwood finish up for me. Somebody get Nigel in here, quick. No onion, please, and a side order of... Uh, what's going on? Where's... Did, did Lance leave again? Do we have a script or a story or any... Oh, he took those, too. That's delightful. Well, this is becoming a bigger disaster than the time Carl Sagan decided to reboot... Family Guy. Chris, you are my oldest offspring. Together, you and I shall look to the heavens and explore the unlimited boundaries of the cosmos. (laughs) Wow, this is just like Bible camp, only I'm not crying and trying to pretend I'm somewhere else. Well, I've just been tweeted an important update. Uh, This is going to be good. Let's see. Lance Neutron will not be tied down to the single position of being just an average anchor of the Multiverse News. So he goes on to say, and I quote, In an effort to take the Neutron Media Network ratings straight to the number one network of all time, your hero, Lance Neutron, has also promoted himself to the role of glamorous talk show host and genius television producer of future super mega hit series. Trust me, it will be fantastic, end quote. How did he fit all that in to 140 characters? Hmm. Well, wasn't this show something? I apologize for our not being quite ready for everything, but you do have to admit, it was better than the last episode of Lost. I'm not sure what exactly that's going to mean in the future, but one thing I am sure of, the Slice of Sci-Fi crew will have another wonderful interview 
coming up right after this. You too can make the Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs. What you do with the rest of your time is strictly up to you. Hey, wait a minute. Does anybody have 12 parsecs yet? Maybe that Sigler guy. Oh, oh yeah. Don't remind me. Isn't he dead yet? The Parsec Awards, a celebration of speculative fiction podcasting. Nominations are open April 15th to June 1st, 2012. Just go to ParsecAwards.com, and we hope to see you at the Parsec Ceremony at DragonCon. These aren't the awards you're looking for. Wait, will you stop that? And welcome back to more of Slice of Sci-Fi. I'm Michael Armenengay. And I'm Brian Brown. Oh, it's almost that time, folks. It is almost time for Eureka to be starting up again. Mm -hmm. And who else do we want to talk to when we talk Eureka? Why is our old friend Jamie Paulia? Welcome, Jamie. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me back. So in case you people are under a rock, Jamie Paulia is co-creator, the writer, producer, Chief Key bottle washer. Grip. I uh, think he runs craft services. Um, <laughs> he may actually be involved with costuming too. We're we're not sure. Yeah. He d- he does everything. <laughs> uh, I wish that that were true. I, luckily, I've got a, an incredibly talented group of people who help you make this show. So. Very true. You do have some really great things. So, Jamie, uh, let's talk about season uh, the last, the final season for Eureka. Uh, sadly, but a, a fact. It's just it is just what it is, and. Uh, we, uh, Michael and I, have gotten the screener, so we've seen mm-hmm. the first three episodes, and I, I believe you said to us you're going that when we watch it, we're going to scream out your name like Khan, Jimmy, <laughs> or something similar to that, right? I, I did say that last season, so uh, how did we do? Uh, yeah, we screamed it loud to the ceilings and uh, scared the neighbors and the cat. Oh my goodness! <clears throat> it was uh, but mission accomplished. <laughs> it was pretty. It, it's it, it's an impressive first three out the gate, to say the least. Yes, and trying not to do spoilers here. Really trying hard not to do spoilers here. But uh, well, why don't we give it to Jamie? Jamie, tell us kind of set up set up this last season. What what's going to kind of happen here? Well, as you uh, may recall from where we left off with uh, season four and a half, the the Astraeus was counting down to launch when suddenly it started to accelerate, and Henry realized that they were actually locked out of the launch sequence by some outside force, Um, somebody or some some other group, something was uh, controlling the launch, and... Uh, there was no way to stop it, so the ship launched prematurely with Allison caught on board, and we didn't know whether or not uh, she was going to make it to the jump scene in time to survive uh, the journey, and we're left with the question, where are they? So the first uh, three episodes are dealing with, with exactly that question. We'll, we'll, we'll find out what's happened to the ship and the crew, and we'll see uh, what's happening with Carter and Henry um, down the ground. Uh, trying to find out where they went. And you really just right out the gate mm. kick us in our teeth. Yep. It's it's a pretty um, ambitious opening um, episode. I think it's you know probably one of the biggest that we've done ever. Um, Matt Hastings, um, our, our, one of our co-executive producers and, and uh, frequent director um, who has done some of our, our greatest episodes, Founders Day, both the Christmas episodes, and, as well as the finale last year, uh, uh, our opener, which I got to write, and uh, I think he did a particularly great job. And then just sort of across the board, I think our visual effects team and our production designers and uh, the Venturi brothers and, and um, you know, our whole crew just made it look more beautiful than it ever has. And from a dramatic standpoint, um, the the work that the actors did, um, I think Sally Richardson of the in particular, really shines in this first episode, does some of the best work that she's ever done. It's, you know, this is uh, very um, powerful stuff that's going on. And, um, you know, lots of, big shocks in store and tragedies and um, trying to find still that balance of drama, emotion, and humor is something that um, I think that they've done some of the, you know, again, the best work that they've ever done, our cast. Yeah, and I agree with that. I do, too. Um, the, th- the one thing I have to, I, I, well, first I'll say is that I think that uh, these first three episodes, I, I would put them on par with uh, the reset that happened yes. a couple seasons on back. 
I'm very curious as to what the fan reaction is going to be to this. I, I really, really am. Um, I, I think we're going to get a little mixed on there, um, yeah. possibly. But here's the big question, and that is because this is such, I mean, it was so out the gate, like, wow. Were you really looking at that going into it, saying, okay, this is our last season, we're just going to go out with a bang? Because, boy, it sure feels like that with these first three well, honestly, no, because we didn't know that it was our last season when we made all these episodes. <laughs> we yeah. actually, as you may recall, um, we were picked up for a season six, and um, we found out uh, the day before we started shooting the, the season finale um, that the season six wasn't going to happen. So we had crafted this entire season five to be a huge setup for season six with this massive cliffhanger ending. And then we didn't, um, uh, we, then we thought that we weren't going to have the opportunity to make that, that sixth season. So, um, you know, I wrote to our network heads and, and our Comcast um, overlords and asked them for to reconsider giving us one more episode so that we could uh, wrap things up at least and try to have a, a proper series finale. Mark Stern, our our network head was very supportive of that, and um, everybody uh, ultimately, gave, after 24 hours of discussion, they, they said yes. But that did leave us in the position of um, me going to the writer's room with Bruce Miller, my co-showrunner, and Todd Sharp, our other partner in crime, co-executive producer, and telling the writers, you know, the good news is we, we got one more episode. The bad news is it, it preps tomorrow. <laughs> um, oh, wow. So what's normally a two-month process of breaking the story, writing an outline, getting notes on the outline from the network and studio, doing the first draft of the script, getting notes on that draft, doing a polish, doing a prep polish, all those things. Um, what's, uh, you know, again, normally a two-month process was uh, essentially five days. Uh, we, we broke the story in, in two days, um, and I wrote the script in three and uh, we started prepping it on that following Monday. Um, you know, we only had four days to prep the episode at that point because we had lost a few days. So we were basically our amazing crew, and everybody pulled together as well. And I think I, I have to just sort of I want to give credit to um, the team that we've had on the show, especially the last couple of seasons. That you know, what could have really been sort of a uh, a sad time and, uh, you know, a time where you get angry or whatever about, about not being able to uh, uh, do what, what you thought you were going to get to do and have to be under those kinds of pressures. But everybody just said, okay, well, let's figure it out. Let's just get to work. And um, I don't think that we would have been able to accomplish uh, the series finale in the way that we did if it hadn't been for all the amazing people who contributed to, to making the show. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm very grateful that we had an incredibly talented team to pull it off. Well, and, that, and that, that's, that's a testament that they said, well, we want to finish this off on a high note instead of saying, oh, well, there's my job gone, you know, we'll just kind of shuffle it out and it'll be done. Yeah, there was none of that. You know, when we yeah. when we got the call, Bruce and I got the call, and then I, I flew up to Vancouver the next um, day to tell the crew uh, and cast in person and and, you know, basically the conversation was, you know, this is really unfortunate. It's, you know, obviously not what we had hoped for. But let's uh, try to approach this last episode as a chance to really enjoy one more time up at that and let's knock it out of the park and celebrate what we've accomplished. And everybody really, I think, had that, that spirit. It was actually a really uh, lighthearted set. Um, there's a lot of laughter, and there are obviously lots of hugs and tears, too. But um, it, it wasn't uh, a sort of a, a depressing experience, those, those last days of shooting. It was actually very um, very much sort of celebratory, and, and everybody sort of appreciating that we've had this seven-year run, um, which um, you know, not very many uh, shows get to do. That's very, very true. So I would be (laughs) completely remiss if I didn't at least ask this question, and that is, if we get everybody to tune in and we get the ratings up, is there any possibility or a chance that we may see something else in the future? A movie, Um, a a miniseries, anything of that sort? You know, I I can't say, I mean, obviously, Eureka itself is not, um, we're not going to save the show show Eureka. Um, 
at this point. We've already struck all the sets, and our actors have been released, and they're going off to other shows. I know that everybody is interested in the potential of uh, doing a movie at some point or a special or, um, you know, if we decide to do a spin-off, it's certainly something that I've had conversations with the network about and they were very receptive to. Um, we'll see what happens. I think that it's 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 uh, not something that I would definitely close the door on. And, and you know, I, I think for, for me, I would just love for the fans to be able to tune in. And, and you know, we've had such an amazing... Um, fan base. I mean, we've grown our ratings, you know, season after season after a record-breaking start that still remains today um, and followed us from one night to a different night to another night in different times and and they've always come back and so I would love for us to end on a high note and I think that this is our strongest season yet um, as much as I loved season four and four and a half. Um, uh, I think that we've actually done some of the best work we've ever done this year and just uh, the, the the level of um, you know creative work on uh, every in every department and, um, and individual has just never been higher. So I think the fans are really going to love it. And um, uh, you know, so I think that we just nice to go out on a high note. And it's one thing to uh, you know. And because your ratings are down and your audience has slipped away and it's like, well, it's time to sort of shuffle off. But that hasn't been the case with us. We know our ratings have been solid and, and you know, we've had this amazing run um, in helping launch other series on the, on, on the channel. And uh, so I think for us to, to end the way we began um, would be great. And I agree. So, folks, uh, Jamie, when did should they tune in? Right away, right? Because it's April 16th, correct? Uh, April sixteenth, nine p.m. Monday is when we start. We'll be we'll be airing on Mondays. I think it will be exception of Memorial Day weekend or something like that. Is then we're going to take a day off there, or Fourth of July weekend. I think it is. Okay. Very good. But um, yeah, mon- Monday is at nine o'clock, starting this coming Monday, April sixteenth. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Jamie. We uh, unfortunately have run out of time again, as we always do when talking with you, because we always enjoy having you in with us. Uh, well, thanks again for having me on, guys, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the season. I can only tell you it gets better. Awesome. All right, folks, we'll be back with more Slice of Sci-Fi right after this. Coming to Halogen this April, it's the longest-running war in Africa. Children are being forced to kill other children. And six young volunteers are doing what they can to bring it to an end. I need to be working for something that is bigger than all of us combined. They put their lives on hold. You work for free, you live out of a van. And taken to the open road. It's taxing at times. I know I'm here for a reason. Join them on their unforgettable quest. The amount of money we need to raise has real consequences in people's lives if we don't. Roadworthy, the Invisible Children Tour, this April, exclusively on Halogen. Hey, Slicer, Sean remembers of more. News from Flight Test Land. Spaceship Edition. Oh, well, the folks at NASA, SpaceX, and... Those aboard the International Space Station are getting ready for a momentous event as they are. Everybody is getting ready for the Dragon capsule to be launched and sent up to uh, resupply the International Space Station. This will be the first time that a private spacecraft has has docked to the International Space Station and SpaceX has a whole heck of a lot riding on this. Also in spacecraft news, OV-103, better known as Space Shuttle Discovery, has been officially mounted to the back of the 747 that will take it to its final home, the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Once there, it'll be dismounted, moved into the Udvar Hazy Center, and Enterprise will be remounted onto the back of the shuttle carrier to be sent to its final resting place in Hell's Kitchen, New York. Yeah. That never out. <laughs> They're sending babies into space. No, they no, are. No, I think those that's the zombie apocalypse that happened last week mm. or a couple oh. days ago. Those they, were the zombies I was afraid yeah, of? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> huh. Little did you know, huh? Little mm. did I know. <laughs> well, I think you have something interesting that we yeah, probably you know, should talk a, bit, a little I, bit I, here. Been th- I've been thinking about this off and on. So, you know, the question always comes up, how do you guys listen to us? Mm-hmm. Do you listen to us through your 
podcatcher? Do you listen to us via video? Do you watch our videos? Or, or, how, or what kind of device do you watch us on? Do you watch us mm-hmm. on your phone, iPod, that sort of thing? I, we're always curious about these sorts of things. So I think it, because it, primarily because we keep having the conversation all the time is is to what what are what devices are out there that people how are, are still, you guys getting to us? Because I mean, really, when was the last time you saw somebody with an iPod? I have one, so I that's mean, why I listen to most of my stuff. But I mean, people have their phones now, you know, so they have the mm-hmm. smartphones and, and they often get their the uh, you know the, us that way. Are you guys watching this video on your smartphones? Mm-hmm. You know, the question also, you know, it comes up with the four W's. You know, where do you guys watch us? Mm-hmm. You know, do you guys watch us in the morning or, or listen to us in the morning on your car ride in or at work? That sort of thing. You know, why do you guys listen to us? Is it because of our news stories? I mean, really seriously, mm-hmm. is it because we're just just so damn awesome? <laughs> yes. More than likely, yes, <laughs> it, it is. It's because we're so awesome. Or is it Sam's why. cleavage? Well, it's of course. It, well, that, yeah, there you go. So, that wins. You know, just you know, if you can call into our voicemail, our you know voicemail line, let mm-hmm. us know. We'll give us some listener feedback and let us know how you guys are getting a hold of Slice. Absolutely We're curious. You know that number two zero six three three nine Trek. That's two zero six three three nine eight seven three five. In fact, we'll be back in a couple of days. Yeah. Send it to mm-hmm. Mike at Slice of Sci Fi if you just want to record on your computer and send it that way. There you Absolutely. go. Send us an email. There you go. All right. All righty. That's going to do it for this week. See you in a few days.